Hello, I'm Julie Goodley and welcome to this episode on rates of reaction. The rate of a reaction tells you how quickly reactants turn into products. We can measure this by measuring the quantity of a reactant used up over time or the quantity of a product formed over time. There are several methods of doing this experimentally and I'm going to show you these methods now. The first method is measuring the decrease in mass of the reactants over time and you can do this when you get a gas being produced. What I'm going to do here is put two grams of calcium carbonate chips into the conical flask, add some acid, I'm going to put a cotton wool bung in the top to enable the gas to be released slowly to give me time to start the stopwatch. And what you should see is a decrease in the reactants over time as the reaction progresses and the carbon dioxide is being produced. That's the calcium carbonate chips. In goes the acid and the mass is currently 26 grams. Hopefully you can see the reaction occurring in the conical flask and over time the bubbles of gas that are being released will come out of the conical flask and the mass will go down. And you can record how much the mass changes over time. After three minutes, the mass had decreased to 24.76 grams. So for the same reaction, because there was a gas produced, we could use this equipment instead. We'd put the reactants in the conical flask, put in a bung with a delivery tube attached to a glass syringe, and you can measure how much gas is produced over a certain period of time. Another method you can use to measure the rate of reaction is when you have two reactants that react together to form a new solid. If you react the two chemicals together in a conical flask on top of a black cross, the reactants react to form a new solid, the solution will go cloudy and you'll no longer be able to see the cross. So you can time how long that takes for the cross to disappear. Any chemical reaction is dependent on particles colliding. Not only do the particles need to collide, they need to collide with enough energy to react. This is called collision theory. The minimum amount of energy particles need to react is called the activation energy. And we can increase the rate of a reaction by either increasing the frequency of collisions or the energy they have when they collide. In collision theory, there are four factors which can affect the rate of a reaction. The first one is the surface area of a solid reactant. If you increase the surface area of the reactant, you can increase the opportunities for collisions to occur. More frequent collisions means a faster rate of reaction. The second factor is the concentration of a liquid or the pressure of a gas. If you increase either of these, you're bringing the particles more closely together and there's more opportunities for collisions. So you get more frequent collisions, a faster rate of reaction. The third factor is the temperature of the reactants. If you increase the temperature, the particles have more energy, so there'll be more frequent collisions and more successful collisions when they do collide because they've got more energy. The final factor is the addition of a catalyst. If you add a catalyst to a reaction, it speeds up the reaction without being used up itself. We're going to look at some of these as demonstrations. Here I have some magnesium. I've got some large strips of magnesium which have a relatively small surface area over which they can react. Here I've got some magnesium powder and because it's powdered, it's got a much larger surface area to react. What I'm going to do now is give you a very simplistic demonstration of the differences in the rate of their reaction. So I'm going to heat up the magnesium strip. Okay. 
And now I'm going to heat up some magnesium powder. And you should be able to see that with the increased surface area, we'll get a much faster reaction because collisions will happen more quickly. So now we're going to look at the effect of concentration. Here I've got two beakers of acid. I've got one beaker which has got the concentrated hydrochloric acid and I've got 25 centimetres cubed of that and I've got 25 centimetres cubed of dilute hydrochloric acid. What we should see when we add a strip of magnesium is a much faster reaction with the concentrated acid because there are more particles there to collide with the magnesium. I've got the same mass of magnesium and I'm going to drop them into the beakers. This one's reacting very quickly and this one's just reacting at the end. Once this is finished reacting, I'm going to show you the effect of a catalyst on the rate of a reaction. I'm going to use the equipment in front of me to demonstrate the effect of catalysts on the rate of a reaction. This is the elephant's toothpaste demonstration. And in this reaction, we have some hydrogen peroxide, which is naturally decomposing all the time into water and oxygen, but you can't see it happening. It's a very slow reaction. We also have some potassium iodide, which is going to be our catalyst, and it's in a powder form to provide a bigger surface area for reaction too. We've got some washing up liquid, so that when our bubbles of oxygen form, we should be able to see the bubbles rising up the tube. And finally, I've got some blue food colouring to enable the reaction to be seen and to make it look like the elephant's toothpaste. So the hydrogen peroxide goes in, some washing up liquid, I'm just going to pour some in. A little bit of blue food colouring. And here's my catalyst. So you can see a very vigorous reaction, very fast reaction affected by the catalyst, speeding up the breakdown of hydrogen peroxide. So now let's move on and look at a couple of the other key practicals. For this practical, I'm going to investigate the effect of five different concentrations of sodium thiosulfate reacting with hydrochloric acid. I'm going to do it in this conical flask, and underneath the conical flask, I've got a black cross, because as the reaction occurs, sulphur is made, which is a solid, and gradually the cross disappears. It starts to go opaque, and then it goes completely cloudy when the reaction is complete. In my measuring cylinder, I've got 10 centimetres cubed of sodium thiosulfate. I'm going to make that up to 50 centimetres cubed with water. So this is my dilute sodium thiosulfate. Each time I do the reaction, I'm going to add the same volume of hydrochloric acid which is 10 centimetres cubed, and then I'm going to start the stopwatch. Give me one swirl.
the solution has started to go cloudy, but I can still see the black cross. And I'm going to stop the stopwatch when it's completely disappeared. I'm now going to do a couple of more reactions and then come back and show you the most concentrated version. For this final reaction, I've got 50 centimetres cubed of sodium thiosulfate undiluted. I'm going to put that in the conical flask. I'm going to add the 10 centimetres cubed of hydrochloric acid and see how quickly the cross disappears again. One swirl, start the stopwatch. This time, the sodium thiosulfate is more concentrated. There are more particles of sodium thiosulfate in there for the hydrochloric acid to react with. It's going cloudy already. And if I look down the top, I'll stop the stopwatch when it's completely disappeared. That's 24 seconds. I'm going to write that value up on the table on the board and we're going to look at the board to discuss it more in detail. For this practical, I had 40 grams per decimeters cubed sodium thiosulfate. In the first reaction, I diluted it down to 8 grams per decimeters cubed by putting in 10 centimetres cubed of sodium thiosulfate and 40 centimetres cubed of water. And that reaction caused the cross to disappear at 184 seconds. Gradually, I increased the concentration of the sodium thiosulfate until it was just sodium thiosulfate at 40 grams per decimetres cubed. And at that concentration, it only took 24 seconds for the black cross to disappear in the conical flask. So as you can see, the more concentrated the reactants, the faster the rate of reaction. I'm now going to show you another key practical which uses a different way of exploring the rate of reaction. For this practical, I'm going to react two concentrations of hydrochloric acid with some magnesium in a conical flask. I'll put the chemicals in there together, insert the bung quickly. The bung is attached to a delivery tube, into a water bath, fed into an upturned measuring cylinder. At the moment, the measuring cylinder is full of water, and as the reaction happens, hydrogen gas gets made, and we can time how long it takes to produce the hydrogen gas. And what I'm actually going to do today is every 10 seconds see how much gas has been made. So I'm putting my 50 centimetres cubed of acid into the conical flask. This is one molar hydrochloric acid. Ideally now you would have two people so that you don't lose any of the gas that's made. I'm going to put the magnesium in insert the bung and start the stopwatch. We can see the reaction happening and I'm waiting to see the gas being produced and arrive in the measuring cylinder. So far, none of the gas has got through the delivery tube into the measuring cylinder. Now it's coming. So we're at 39 seconds, 40 seconds, I've got five centimetres cubed of gas. Then at 50 seconds, I've got eight centimetres cubed of gas. At 60 seconds, I'm up to 12 centimetres cubed of gas. The reaction stopped and at 70 seconds I'm still at 12 centimetres cubed of gas. Now I'm going to repeat the reaction with a different concentration of acid. 
Up on the board are the results of the reaction at one mole per dm cubed hydrochloric acid, which you saw me do. And I've also done another experiment at two moles per dm cubed hydrochloric acid. This is the more concentrated acid. And when there's a more concentrated acid, the particles of the acid can collide more quickly with the magnesium, producing the hydrogen more quickly. As you can see from the data up on the board, at one mole per dm cubed, the reaction finished at 60 seconds. But for two moles per dm cubed, it finished at 40 seconds. You can see the reaction's finished because no more gas is being produced. You can plot this data on a graph and compare it visually and see what's happening at the two concentrations very easily. Up on the board is a graph of the rate of reaction. On the x-axis is time in seconds and on the y-axis is the loss of mass in grams. So this might be the kind of graph you'd plot if you reacted calcium carbonate chips with hydrochloric acid. There are two curves on the graph. The one in white would be with a more concentrated hydrochloric acid and the one in blue would be with the less concentrated hydrochloric acid. You can see the difference in the rate of reaction quite easily. What you can do with this is at 50 seconds, for example, you could work out the rate of reaction at that time point. In order to do this, you draw a tangent, and I've drawn that in orange, at 50 seconds. I've extended the tangent until it crossed the y-axis, and I've drawn a right angle triangle. If you look up at the board, you can see that I can work out the rate of reaction at 50 seconds now. I've looked at the difference in mass divided by the time taken and found out the rate of reaction. You can also draw a tangent at the very start of a reaction at naught seconds, extend the tangent, draw a triangle and find out the initial rate of reaction. I've done this here. And as you can see, the initial rate of reaction is much faster than later on in the reaction. In both cases, you need to remember to write the units. And in this example, it's grams per second. In this episode, we've looked at the rates of reactions. We've looked at the factors that affect the rate of a reaction, collision theory, and demonstrated two key practicals measuring the rates of reactions. Download the notes below and check out the videos on positive-charge.co.uk and make sure you like and subscribe.